Hello everybody! In this tutorial we still keep the same Pong game, but we are going to be making some updates. And by the end of this tutorial our Pong game is going to be looking like this. We have a couple more colors and otherwise it's still basically the same game. And yeah, that's pretty much it. But the most important thing is that we don't just make updates, instead we are going to rewrite our code quite fundamentally, with the purpose of having just sprites to organize our code. And this should make our code ready to add more stuff in the future. So let's jump right in. The main problem our game has right now is that we are essentially only using a functional approach, which means that we're using functions to organize the logic of all of it, which is fine for a very basic game, but we can already see some problems arising from our approach. The most visible one is that we have a ton of global variables, which does get problematic quite fast. So in our code right now, especially for the ball animation, we have way too many global variables. The score is a global variable, the ball speed is a global variable, the score time is a global variable. There's way too much stuff in the global scope, which is generally bad practice for code. And the way we are going to update our code is that we are going to use sprite classes, which organize our code much better and give us specific objects. So effectively our player pedal, our ball and our opponent pedal are going to be objects. And each of them has attributes and methods that organize our entire game. And if you organize it like that, our game is much more modular and much easier to maintain. And once we have that, we can add much more stuff to it later on without much hassle. So effectively, we're going to take our game, organize it in sprite classes, and then add some slight visual improvements to it. And just as a recap for sprites. If you're completely new to sprites, then this video is probably going to be confusing but I made an entire dedicated video just on sprites, so if you're completely new to the concept, check this one out first. But in short, a sprite in Pygame is a class that can combine a surface and a rectangle, so that we can work with it easier. And then this sprite class can be moved into a group, and then we can update each sprite in that group quite easily. So let's talk about how I'm going to reorganize the code to make it more manageable. And I'm actually going to use five different classes in there, so it is getting a little bit more complex. The most basic class I have is a block class, and this one is not going to be drawn on the screen. However, the three main classes on the screen, the player pedal, the ball and the opponent pedal, are going to inherit from that class. So the block class is basically just there to save me some writing. It just takes a surface and puts a rectangle around it and puts it on the screen. Nothing fancy here. The first major class we have is our player class, and this is our player pedal that we can control. And this one only does two things, it can be moved and has a constraint, so that we cannot move it outside of the screen. Then we have our ball class, and this one is the most complex one of them all. And it has quite a few different methods. It has one to move the ball itself, just like we had before. Then we have a collision method that calculates all the different collisions with the top and the bottom of the screen and the player and the opponent. Then we have a reset ball method that resets the ball to the middle of the screen. Then we have a restart counter method that basically gives us a counter if a score has been achieved. And finally, we have the opponent class. And this one is also quite simple. It only really has two methods. The first one is the update method and the second one is the constraint method. And it works kind of like the player class. The update method moves the opponent and it just moves it to wherever the ball happens to be. And the constraint method just makes sure that it doesn't move outside of the screen. So also quite simple. So these would be the first four classes but there's going to be one more class that I called Game Manager. And our Game Manager class actually organizes the entire game. And this isn't strictly necessary, but it is going to make it much easier to organize our code later on. And what this class does is that it runs the game loop, it resets the ball to the middle of the screen, and it draws the score at the end. And with these five classes, we can recreate our entire Pong game logic. And I'm not going to go through the entire code line by line. Instead, I have already written the entire thing and I'm just going to go for each object and explain how it works, so that this tutorial isn't going to be an hour long. But with that, let's jump into our code. Right at the top, we have the five different classes that organize our code. And for now, I have hidden all of them, but I'm going to talk about them in just a second. For now, let's talk about the easy stuff, the one that we already have. The first one is the general setup, where we have our mixer pre in it, we have our pygame in it, and our clock. This one stays just the same, no change here. Then we have our main window. This one also stayed exactly the same. So we have screen width and screen height. We create our display surface and then we give it a title. That one's pretty simple. 
Then we have our global variables. We have a background color and now we have an accent color. And the accent color is a dark bluish color. And it's for the text, so the score and the line in the middle. It's nothing fancy. Then we have our font, then we have the two sound files, and then we have a middle strip. And the middle strip is just a rectangle that is the line in the middle of our screen. It is four pixels wide and it goes from the middle two pixels to the left and two pixels to the right. So it's really just a thick line. And all of this is actually incredibly simple. So if you could follow the last tutorials, then this one should seem quite familiar. And if I go a bit further down, we still have our event loop. And in here, this one also looks fairly similar. We're gonna explain what these lines mean in a bit more detail later on. But they should already look quite familiar. They didn't change all that much. But in the actual game loop, we still have a background color. Then we draw the rectangle, that's the middle strip. And then in our game manager, we have run game. So all the game logic runs in here. And then we do the usual, we just render the entire thing. So all of this is pretty simple. Now let's go for each class and talk through it one by one. So I go all the way to the top and let's start with the block class. This one is the easiest. So let me open it. And all it does is it takes a path to a file, an X position and a Y position. And then in our screen, it puts this image on a new surface. It draws a rectangle around that surface and it places the new rectangle somewhere on the screen wherever we specified it. So this entire class is basically the easiest kind of sprite we can possibly create. And it doesn't really do much more. And the only reason we have it is that for the player, the ball and the opponent, they all inherit from this block class. And this is the only reason why it's here. It basically just saves me some writing. But all right, we can close this one and never worry about it again. So quite easy. And with that, we come to the player class. And this is the first one where actual stuff happens. So when we start, it inherits the stuff from the block class, and then it has two attributes beyond the block class. It has a speed that we define and a movement. And then in the update method, we take the rectangle and add self.movement. And the logic here is quite similar to the stuff we had before. Basically, our rectangle is always being moved on every single frame of the game. However, if we don't press any button, the movement that's being added to the rectangle is going to be zero. So for all practical purposes, if you move something by zero, it just doesn't move. However, when we press a button, this movement value is going to become the value of this speed attribute. And all of this happens further down here in the code in our event loop, all the way down here, all of this. So the player movement is gonna be minus equal or plus equal to player speed. So for example, if we press the up button, then the player movement attribute is gonna get minus equal player speed which in our case, when we create the class, it's gonna be five. So it's gonna be minus five, so it's gonna move upwards. And then when we lift the key up, then we add the same number to it. So effectively, player movement becomes zero again, and the paddle stops moving. So this is all that this line here does. And then we come to the constraint method, and all this one does is prevent our player from moving outside of the screen. And this one works exactly in the same way what we have created earlier. If the top of the player goes outside of the screen, so if it's smaller than zero, then we place the top of the player at position zero. If the bottom of the player gets higher than the screen height, then we place the bottom of the player at the screen height. And the important thing here really is that the logic for this was already established. We just put it in the context of a class. So if we compare this to the function we created earlier, it is really similar. The major difference is the self in the beginning. But all right, with all of that one done, we have our player class and it's actually really simple. So when we go down into the creation of all the important variables, here we create a player from the player class. It gets a picture, this one here. We place it at the X position and the Y position and we give it a speed. Then on this line, we create a pedal group and then we add the player towards that. And with that one, let's close the player again and let's go to the ball class. And this is the really large one. And again, when we create it, we inherit a couple of attributes from the block class, and we're going to add three more attributes. We have speed X, speed Y, and the paddles. And the paddles are gonna be the paddles for the player and for the opponent. So this one is a group of paddles. But this one comes in just a second. For now, speed X and speed Y, we put them in here, 
and we randomize whatever value has been put inside of it, which basically means when the ball is starting, it goes into a random direction. Then we have a group of the pedals, and this is gonna be, when we go down a little bit, we have here, for the pedal group, we have the player and the opponent. The opponent I'll explain in just a second. But when we create the ball, we put this pedal group in there so that the ball knows where the two pedals are so it can collide with them and bounce off them. That's the only reason we have it in there. So let me go all the way up again. This is this line here. And then we have two more attributes that don't need to be specifically declared, self.active and score time. Self.active basically determines if the ball is moving or not. And score time is to check the time when a score was being achieved. And this is the logic we have seen earlier, that if a score is being achieved, we want to start a countdown to wait a couple of seconds until the ball starts moving again after the score was achieved. And all of this basically happens in this part here, the update method. And basically what happens in here is that if self.active is true, then we are moving the ball and checking for collisions. And if it's not true, we start the restart counter. And this is really similar to the logic we had before. And the collision logic happens down here. And this one should also look quite similar. It is what we have done the last video. In this line here, we check a top or bottom collision. So this one is super simple. And all of this part here is to check the collisions for the different paddles. So both the player and the opponent paddle happens in here. And this logic should look really, really similar. In the last tutorial, we created this entire thing for each of the pedals, but that isn't actually necessary. So it's quite simple to combine. And with that one done, we have our reset ball method. And this one just puts the ball in the middle of the screen and starts the count on timer. So the score time is being set here. And again, we have seen a really similar functionality before. And then finally, we have our restart counter. And all this one does is that it draws the number on the screen, how far down the count on timer is. And this one is identical to what we have done earlier, except in the context of a class. And all right, that is the ball class. It is quite a long one. Okay, and then we come to the opponent class and this one gets a bit easier again. So in here, we still inherit the same stuff from before and we give it a speed value. And then in the update method, we move this paddle wherever the ball happens to be. And this one is really similar to the logic we had before. And then just like for the player, we have a constraint method, and this one constrains the opponent to the screen. And when we create this opponent, which happens all the way down here, we put it in the same group as the player. So the pedal group has the player and the opponent. And then this group is being passed into the ball. So this would cover our first four classes. And they are quite extensive already. But now we come to the game manager. And this is where the actual logic of the game happens. So we put all of these four classes together and make a game out of it. And I can't get it all on one screen, but that's okay. So when we create it, it doesn't inherit anything. And we have a couple of attributes. We have the ball group and the pedal group. So where the ball is and where our pedal group is. And then by default, the score is zero and we make the groups part of the class itself. Then we have our run game method, and this is where the actual game loop happens. And here we have the pedal group and the ball group. So this is where we just draw everything on the screen. And then in the pedal group, we update it and we pass in the ball group. And this is quite important. So let me go up and let me open the opponent group first. That one's the easier one. So when we call update on the opponent group, we pass in the ball group. And then this method uses the ball group to move the opponent. So this one needs this argument. However, for the player group, when we look at the update method, this one also needs the ball group as an argument, but it doesn't actually use it, but you still have to put it in there because when we call all the way it was here, when we call the update method, then this paddle group is gonna call the update method on every single sprite inside of it. So it's gonna call the update on the opponent and on the player, and it's gonna pass this one into it. And if we don't specify a parameter in the player group for this, then it would cause an error. So if you want to pass in an argument into any sprite in a group, you effectively have to pass it into all members of the group, which can be a bit cumbersome, but it's generally workable. 
And especially in our case, it's quite a straightforward thing to do. So let's close all of this again. And we're back here. We just update our pedal group and then we also update our ball group. And after that, we have reset ball and draw score. Reset ball is quite an interesting class. So let me explain. And the important thing you want to be aware of here is that our ball class also have a reset ball class. So we have two reset ball methods in our game. And they are named similarly by design. And effectively, the reset ball method of the game manager calls the reset ball method of the ball itself. So that effectively, this entire method resets the ball and adds the score to whoever achieved the score. And then finally, we just draw the score. And this happens on every single frame. And all of that is basically the logic of our game. And if you compare this to the previous game we made, then you are going to see quite a lot of similarities. And I hope that made sense. And let me know if you're going to go through this in more detail. However, there's one thing I do want to cover. And this is when we create the ball, we call group single. And this might throw you off if you just follow these tutorials. That in Pygame, we have two different kinds of groups. We have pygame.sprite.group and we have pygame.sprite.group single. And both of these groups are really similar. The only real difference is given from the name, that the group can take any number of sprites. So we could have 100 different sprites in here and update them all at the same time. Group single, on the other hand, only accepts a single sprite. And if you added another sprite to this group, it would kick out the ball sprite. So a group single only ever has a single sprite in there, kind of like the name implies. But besides that, it does the exact same thing. You can still call update on it and it would update the sprite inside of it. But okay, that is basically all of it. I hope that made sense and let me know if you want me to go through all of this in more detail. But that would be quite a long tutorial. But yeah, I'll see you.